Hello, and welcome back to the Hockey Podcast. This is a fan run podcast about the Chicago Blackhawks, and it's the end of the preseason, and we are ready to get into a brand new season of Blackhawks hockey, officially this time. My name is Tyler, and I'm joined, as always, by my three co-hosts, Wally. I cannot wait for Tuesday night. Nick. Man, this offseason was way too long. I can't wait. It's time to go. And John. Rip Samuel Savoie. I mean, kind of. Um, we'll get into everything involved in the preseason right here. I um, want to start by talking about sort of our predictions as we headed into the preseason. So on the last episode, which we made about two weeks ago, we talked about a couple of players who we thought would – break out in the preseason, who we thought we were most excited to watch, but most importantly, who had the most to prove. I want to start with our picks for most to prove. Probably the one that was the most contentious of these was Wally's pick, because you had Kevin Korchinski. Um, with everything that happened this preseason, what did you think about how Kevin Korchinski did? To be honest, I think uh, Kevin Korchinski, he was kind of iffy. Um he was impressive in the offensive zone, and he did put up, like, three points, I believe. Uh, I also liked his, like, ability to move the puck, which, I mean, we all we already knew he was very good uh, with the puck. Um, he was rough in the defensive zone, though, and he didn't really mesh well with Connor Murphy. So it was, it was kind of an iffy preseason for him, to be honest. I do still think he makes the team, uh, but it, was, it, it wasn't a great preseason for him, if I'm being completely honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would kind of agree there with you, Wally. I felt like offensively he was great. Defensively, he had those rookie, like, 19-year-old mistakes out on the ice. So let's be honest. He's 19. It's a preseason. He's still developing his game. I'm not too worried about uh, Korchinski in any way right now. I still think that despite that, we still all feel that he's going to be on that roster. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that despite the problems, the issues in preseason, I don't think that's going to change the fact that he is on the roster, for now at least. Yeah, I feel like after World Juniors is over, he's in Seattle helping the Thunderbirds, or if he got traded, go on to a Memorial Cup playoff run again. Next one, uh, this was Nick's pick for most approved in the preseason, and I would say personally that I think that he did a good job of proving himself, and that was Cole Gutman. Uh, Nick, what do you think about how Cole Gutman's preseason went? I really like how Gutman played. I, if I'm not mistaken, he had maybe one assist in the entire playoff, in the entire preseason. But man, he played with a lot of urgency out on the ice, good intensity. He didn't lose a step from his injury, and I really enjoyed how uh, Gutman came out to prove himself, and I think he may make the roster. If not, he'll get uh, moved down to Rockford, and every now and then we'll see him up in Chicago here and there. I think that for me personally, the overarching uh, point of – Everything that I've seen this entire preseason. Um, if any of you have seen Whose Line Is It Anyway, the main thing they say on there is the points don't matter. I think when it comes to all the players in this preseason, the points don't matter. Because I don't mm-hmm. think that anyone's point totals actually necessarily reflect their performance in the preseason. Oh, yeah. And that's not just like a generic statement. I think especially for how they played in this preseason. I think there's a lot of guys who played well with zero points and a lot of guys who had more than zero points who didn't really do what I thought they would. And Gutman's one of them. He didn't register a point all preseason yet. I thought he actually had a pretty good time. Yeah, he looked really good out there. So he didn't lose a step from his injury that ended a season short last year. And I feel like he came out with, Guns of Blazing almost had a couple goals, and he was out there to produce and uh, prove himself for a roster spot. Didn't he uh, hit two posts, I believe? 
for one. He had three post uh, in the sec- in the final preseason game. I re- reckon I remembered watching it vividly when I was <laughs> at the game. So I was like, "Damn, he needed that to go in." <laughs> Well, it didn't change his roster status. At least we don't think so. Um, Currently, roster cuts are not official yet as of Sunday night as we are recording this. However, from the waivers decisions that were made, a lot of the players who were on the bubble, you can now tell whether they made it or not. All the waiver eligible players, which tells you Joey Anderson did not, but it also tells you that Reese Johnson and Entwistle and also Boris Kachuk all made this roster. Yeah. And that actually takes it over to my uh, most to prove in this preseason, which was Mackenzie Entwistle. And I think he did enough to make the team, but I can't necessarily say that I think he did enough to guarantee his spot on the roster once Kurashev is back, and we have more roster spots that are being filled. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, the fact is uh, that Entwistle has the speed and can play defensively a little bit stronger than like Joey Anderson or Boris Kachuk and Reese Johnson. I think that kind of helps him have a chance in staying up in the team but we'll see how it goes closer to when Kurashev is back uh Wally John <laughs> oh I mean yeah I think he again I think he did enough to make the team I don't think he was necessarily amazing but I think he did enough to make the team I think he was at least better than Boris Kachuk, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. And I know that the Blackhawks coaching staff, specifically Derek Kane, is very fond of Reese Johnson. Um, so I feel like it would probably come down to those two. Uh, but I, th- I think he definitely did enough to make the team, at least for right now. Um, I would agree. It was kind of rough and rough, though, in the beginning with the, with the incident on the 2-on-0. Two, two oh. And then... Uh, but then he uh, really pulled it together when he had that nice move on uh, Jordan Bennington in the last game. I feel like that 2 on 0 really showed how bad the United Center ice was that night because apparently it was 90 degrees that day of that preseason game, and the ice was one of the worst ice surfaces it's ever been. That is ridiculous. Um, I know it was a bit hot, but... The, the the Blackhawks ice, and it was not. It was more than just one preseason game where that was being said. Like it was a consistency yeah. all preseason where people were like, "The ice is just bad." It felt like in the happening. It felt like in the final preseason wow. game at the United Center against the Wild, the ice looked like it started to smooth out, and the players weren't falling all over the freaking place. The well, first two games they were. Get, I certainly hope that this all gets fixed before the Blackhawks' home opener, which of course they have plenty of time to fix it because yeah. they have a surprising amount of time between the first game of the season and the actual home opener because they don't play at the UC until two weeks from yesterday. Yeah, October 21st. Which is also the Ice Hogs home opener. It's kind of weird the Ice Hogs and Blackhawks have the same home opener night. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, sticking over to the next thing, which was the last player to prove, was John's pick, which was Isaac Phillips. I can't necessarily say that I think that he did enough to make this team, and I don't think that in the end he did make the team. And it primarily comes down to what you said, John, at the time, which was Wyatt Kaiser has been the star of the beginning of training camp, and that carried into the uh, the, the preseason as well. Uh, yeah, so I don't think... Yeah, I agree with you. What you were saying there, uh, Isaac Phillips probably makes this team if 
there wasn't a dude named Wyatt Kaiser also in our prospect system because out of every out of every other uh, Rockford defenseman, he was probably the the best out of all of them. And so, at this point now, continue. Uh, I don't think he played like terrible, but he also didn't play like anything special either. But what the problem with that is that uh, Wyatt Kaiser was special this preseason in this training camp. So I think we see him on the roster eventually, just yeah, not right now. Mm-hmm. I feel yeah, bad I for I like, that way well. I have to say, I do feel bad for Phillips. He does play a good defensive game, but also it doesn't help that if we had a player who's kind of a traffic cone out there and uh, Nikita <laughs> Zaitsev uh, on the right side, I feel like Phillips could make the roster, but uh, or Jared Tenority, both of them, in my opinion, probably shouldn't be on the Blackhawks at this point in time. Let the young guys all come up at once. But honestly, I feel like once uh, Korchinski's probably sent down to the WHL, uh, we see Phillips up full time. Yeah, that's probably I would think so as well. Um, yeah, I think that also when it comes to Kaiser, he showed so much in this preseason that he almost feels like a better option to pair next to Connor Murphy than Kevin Korchinski does. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I think that what we've seen with Korchinski paired with Murphy has to be quite similar to what we saw a couple years ago with Murphy paired next to Eric Gustafson. The issue Mm -hmm. of him not being able to carry a disastrous defenseman when it comes to the defensive side of the game. And neither Korchinski nor Eric Gustafson three years ago were good at the defensive parts of hockey. So... And that made Murphy struggle back then. And it's making Murphy struggle now. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to disagree so I think that with when that. When you look at it, Kaiser seems to be the best. Yeah. I'm not going to disagree with that, Tyler, because all that is true. I, I, I would feel, what's the word? I would feel even more nervous for Korchinski if I have to pair him with either Tornorti or uh, uh, Zaitsev. I think that's just a recipe for disaster. That is a concern. Yeah. That's. That's not put him with I, I would hate that. I would. I would hate that so much. Put him up with Seth. Um, but then you're, yeah. But then you're pushing down either uh, Alex Vlasic then to pull. Well, Vlasic's already on the third pair, so I don't think it would be that big of an issue. I think you could handle Vlasic with Zaitsev actually. I think that's where he's playing right now, right? He or was playing up to. with Jones at points. Oh, okay. I know last yeah. year he was, but yeah. I, for this preseason, I think they've mostly had him. On the third pairing, from what I recall, so yeah, he did play Kinda more on the third pairing, and I feel like if he's on the third pairing and has to deal with Zaitsev or Tornorti, Vlasic is the better of those uh, other two defensemen. I yeah. feel like he can um, play defensively, but the fact is, Zaitsev and Tornorti are going to bring those uh, bring down a development of the players like Vlasic or. Korchinski or uh, Kaiser at any point this season. You and are I, correct, Wally. Um, yeah. Vlasic was playing with Zaitsev for the last, or for from August or to September uh, 21st to the 22nd. So you are in right. Okay. All right. I wonder if we feel. Let's, not, let's not try here. If we feel more solid with, like, Seth Jones being paired with Vlasic and, say, Murphy being paired with Kaiser, and we don't want to really put Korchinski there, is there a chance that we see him just go straight to Seattle? There's a possibility. Because really the... De- you go next. There, the development is key for Korchinski. If they're pairing him with a um, Tenorti or a Zaitsev, that's a recipe for disaster and it's going to hinder any development for Korchinski because Korchinski's game's best when he has the puck in the offensive zone defensively as well. When he's not going to be like that defenseman to play back and play, uh, be a shutdown guy. Mm-hmm. I know he had the... 
he logged the most minutes last night in the final preseason game with 24 and a half minutes on the ice, only Blackhawk to be plus 20 on the ice last night. And honestly, it would be bad to see if they put him with like a uh, Zaitsev or a Tornority. You don't want to hinder his development. Yeah. At the same time, though, if the plan is to keep him up, then it'll give him more opportunities to work his way higher up the lineup. And if we're seeing him in the top four, paired with Murphy or Seth, if either of those start to work, then we get in a position where if he's just killing it, do you send him down there? Because if the oper- if the situation is he's either a top four defenseman or he's not here, mm-hmm. then well then you're taking out a top four defenseman halfway through the season. I wonder where we go there. There's a obviously the opportunity where Korczynski is up here for the main, the entire season. There's also the chance that let him play nine games, send him to Seattle. There's a chance that at the midway point, if he's hurting in development and you aren't seeing much improvement, you send him to the World Juniors, let him get some confidence back in himself, and then where he um, is going on for a playoff run in the WHL. There's three opportunities, and I feel like we're on the two – the ladder of the two of the longer stint of the full season or going down at world juniors and not see him back till next season. It's possible. I think it's also possible that he didn't do enough to make the team. And Kyle Davidson says, Hey, you didn't, you didn't earn this spot. Mm -hmm. And Isaac Phillips makes a team over him. I would be okay with it. I personally don't want, Korchinski in the NHL this year. I've been saying that all off season. I want him to not worry about being up here and hindering his development and getting the opportunity to fail at points. I feel like for him, it's best for him to be- find where he needs to be and it's developing his game. It might not be in the NHL. It might be in the NHL. We'll still see that hasn't come out yet. Yeah. I wouldn't have agreed with you two weeks ago. But I don't know if he's NHL ready right now after what I've seen. I know that he had Mm -hmm. those three points. But they were all going that direction. Mm It's everything going this direction, which is tragic to say the least, actually. It's not good. Nolan say, Allen looks more NHL ready at this point. It's crazy how right you are, actually. <laughs> um, and talking about Nolan Allen, I want to step into... Okay. Can I just say something real quickly? Do you have anything to add on Korchinski? I kind of. Kind of, yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, I don't... As we all agreed, uh, we don't feel confident in Korchinski playing with either of Tenorti or Zaitsev. And to go off of uh, Tyler's point and Nick's point, um, I would feel more confident in Alex Vlasic playing with either of those guys, even though I don't mm-hmm. want him playing with either of those guys. He's more stay-at-home. He's, a, he's, a, he's probably a – I guess you could classify him as a two-way defenseman. He probably leans more towards the defensive side, though. I would feel more comfortable with Alex Vlasic with either of those guys, mm-hmm. personally. I would, too. Yeah. But that would mean that Kevin Korczynski has earned a spot in the top four. Or not on the roster. Well, in that scenario, then you're looking at Isaac Phillips in the top four, which he hasn't really earned that either. That's true, though, yeah. I don't know. It's Yeah, it's going to be interesting because they haven't cut any of the defensemen yet. Mm -hmm. We'll see. And by the time this is out, it'll be clear. 
Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Who actually made the team. But for now, we aren't sure. Who knows? Korchinski could be there. Korchinski could not be there. Phillips could be there. Phillips could not be there. Um, the only thing that we know is that Seth will be there. Zaitsev will be there. Tenori will be there. And Murphy will be there because they're the only defensemen out of the eight that were, are not waiver exempt. And none of them were placed on waivers. Mm-hmm. So we'll see with the rest of the group. I yep. uh, want to pin it over to our next topic of conversation, which was our picks before the preseason of who we thought of like the guys who aren't likely to make the roster. Which of those guys did you expect to be the biggest standout? And I think of the entire list um, here, of the entire list, Wally, you're the winner. <laughs> because you said Nolan <laughs> Allen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I will say I wasn't necessarily expecting him to be that good. I was more so just going off of what uh, Luke Richardson was saying, to be completely honest. And he was pra- he was praising him a lot, so I was just like, okay, may as well go with that one. And he looked really good. And I think he's going to be great in Rockford. And I think if if one of the right handed defensemen get gets hurt, I think he's probably the first call up instead of I don't know. Let's say Phillips doesn't make the team. I think. Nolan Allen is probably going to be the first call up. So, yeah, I was pretty happy with that pick. Absolutely. I think that especially the best part about it is the fact that Nolan Allen, despite being a left handed defenseman, is playing on the right side. And he did that for the majority of preseason. And And throughout throughout that time, he looked very solid on that right side. And I think he was playing right side in Seattle last year as well. Yeah. Half the season he was playing right side in Seattle. So I think that that's something, even though he's a left shot, he fits onto that right hand, right side depth chart. Yeah. Moving on to the other picks, um, biggest loser, that goes to me because I said Jackson Stauber. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that was brutal. I feel oh, bad for no, Jackson. <laughs> I feel bad uh, for Jackson. Man, that was brutal. Not a good game for him when he played in the preseason. That yeah. one didn't go well. Uh, Two games. Not we don't good. really need to talk more about it, but he will be he will be back in Rockford this year, which we did, all expected. Did Camesso jump Stahlberg already as starter in Rockford? Oh no, he was I already he was, he was already the starter. The pre- before the yeah, he was already the okay starter. I still think that Stauber is the first call up. Okay. Yeah. Do you think those, those, way, those, are two, those are two different things? Those are well, the, I the mean, first, the first call up and the Rockford starter are not always the same thing. And I think in oh, this yeah. situation, they're not the same thing. Let's be honest. We are the team with Peter Mrazek. Mrazek gets injured every season. It's not a matter of when. It's a matter. Yeah, it's not a matter of it's if. Matter it's a matter, of, it's a matter, of, matter when. of when. Because Morazic will get injured. He always finds a way to get injured. So Stogberg, I feel like will be. I agree. He will be the first call up in net. But man, Camesso looked really good. Yeah, he had a solid game. Uh, he had a solid game in the prospect uh, showcase, and he had a yeah. solid game in his preseason time. I think that. Drew Camesso looks to be in a good state right now, and I want to see that continue heading into the Rockford season. Yeah. Moving on to another pick. This one was Nick's pick, and this guy filtered throughout a couple other picks in the next category. Um, I wouldn't say it was a bad decision. I wouldn't say it was a bad uh, shout. It's just unfortunate that Samuel Savoy got hurt Oh, that was hard to watch. Man, I was so sad when I saw that happen. Sammy is one of my favorite prospects in the system, as everyone knows. But, oh, oh man, I feel bad for Sammy. I also I, felt that in the game that he was playing up to that point, he actually oh, looked yeah. really solid. And especially, I thought that he was better in terms of like his offensive play than he was the previous year. Oh, yeah. He was moving the puck well. He was playing good hockey. And then the fluke injury happened and out for the year. 
yeah, it's un it's unfortunate what happened. Um, luckily, it looks like the surgery that he had was successful. He will be injured Staying for a while. With Chicago. We'll see. Yeah, he'll stay with Chicago probably. That that happens a lot, especially when Luke, it comes to these situations. Richardson basically said that uh, Sammy is is going to be staying with the Blackhawks, and he's already been. Uh, joking with the guys after his, during his recovery already, so that's good to hear. I think it's a good thing actually. Yeah. I yeah. think that having him here is better because he is a player that we view in the organization moving forward. So, okay. and I think that he can be a very solid depth player for us. So I think that having him around the group is no problem. Yep. Last pick of the preseason. For this was John's pick. He went with Ethan Del Mastro as the guy who he thought would be the biggest preseason star and the shine, the guy who shone shined the brightest of anyone who we didn't necessarily think would be a roster lock or even a roster option. Potential, yeah. I felt that he was fine the preseason. I didn't think he had a spectacular preseason, but I can't say that he was like. Terrible. Yeah, I would agree with that. He wasn't really super noticeable in his time on uh, playing. So that for a defenseman, that's actually kind of a good thing. That's a young defenseman. So I feel like that's okay to say. Yeah. Yeah, that works for now. Next conversation I want to have is we went into the most excited to watch and for everyone here, we all kind of agreed that the top guy was Connor Bedard. Yes. <laughs> I do want to have the Connor Bedard conversation because I think that with what we know of his quality, I think that he was pretty bad in this preseason for what we know he's capable of. I think that he could have done so much more. Yeah. I know the points came. I know that he had the point totals. But I don't think that his actual performances really lined up with those point totals. Yeah. And he'll say that too. He said every after every game that he uh he played like trash or however you want to say it. I feel like he had the sparks of moments where yeah, he was really good. Uh and then there were the points where He's still an eighteen-year-old trying to find his way in the NHL, and also this is preseason. No one's going to remember anything from the preseason once he makes his NHL debut against Pittsburgh on Tuesday. Well, I certainly hope that no one remembers anything from this preseason because. No I mean, if they remember it. something from this preseason, they'll remember that, that overtime pass. Yeah. That was, good. It was a really good pass. Pretty good. Oh, yeah. yeah. But no one remembers, like, what Kane and Taze did in their preseason in their rookie year. It's going to be a similar situation with Bedard. No one remembers uh, McDavid's preseason. No one remembers Crosby preseason in their rookie years. This is where we're at. I would agree. Yeah. I actually think that the next guy to talk about who both Wally and John had as, other than Bedard, the guy to watch for preseason in terms of like the Hawks players on the preseason. This guy was probably my favorite player to watch all preseason. That was Lucas Reichel. Oh, yeah. He was really good. Because he was playing center. And he looked mm -hmm. good at it. And we talked before. John, you mentioned this in the last episode that he gained a little bit of weight, added a little bit more strength to his frame. That's important for him because that way, now he actually looks like he fits at center as opposed to getting knocked off the puck a ton. Because right, go picture. Um, yeah, so I think we've all been pretty vocal about how we didn't want to see Reichel playing at center. And I think we should all apologize to... <laughs> <laughs> to whatever to Kyle Davidson and uh, Luke Richardson about that because he looked pretty good at it. I think at one point in I think the first game he was like 
a hundred percent on uh, at the faceoff dot. Uh, no, the no, first game he was thirteen percent. Yeah, he, okay, he went like he went like one for six or something. I think the one that he won was in maybe the, that was overtime. Maybe I'm I thinking believe. of Bedard. Yeah, you're oh, thinking of Bedard. Yeah, he was okay. good. In, he was good at um, faceoffs. So for, forget I said that. Um. So yeah, Lucas Reichel looked good. Well, over um, the course of over the course of the entire preseason, uh, over the course of the entire preseason, according to National Stat Trick, Lucas Reichel won forty six percent of his draws. Kyle yeah. Bedard won forty five percent of his draws over the course of the entire preseason. So I'm not actually that concerned because I'm not worried. I think no. both of them will be okay. They'll both yeah. be okay. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 One thing I noticed with Reichel when I was at the game, he did bulk up. He's not as scrawny as he was last season when I saw him play a game in Rockford and the games I saw him play in Chicago. He did bulk up. For any for anyone who didn't watch the last podcast. And that's obviously something good to happen. That's obviously mm-hmm. something good to happen. Because even if his long term future isn't at center, that still is a good thing for him to have as a player in general. Mm-hmm. And it's good for him to be a winger. If he's a winger long-term, that added uh, strength on his frame is still good. I know, to, I know uh, that uh, Kyle and Luke were both saying how Reichel was um, off-season training was building to get bigger, get bigger in his frame to – work at that base off dot to be bigger and stronger at the dot. So I feel like it actually worked and he looked really good at the dot when except for that first game. Yeah. I want to go back and just look at a couple more guys who I think stood out. Um, None of us actually picked this guy, but I think that in terms of other guys who actually had fantastic preseasons and I don't, he only played one game, but I really thought Nick Lardis was a good flash. Yeah. His performance, I think that he was active off puck, especially. But he was a penalty killer out there and he had like that penalty killing breakaway that he had. Mm-hmm. He's good Florida's performance. Not a for good him. preseason. I already think he's better than Gavin Hayes. <laughs> yeah, I think the skating already makes him a more projectable player yeah. than Hayes. And his shot is arguably better. So yeah. Or it just looked really good. I would agree there. Yeah. Um, wasn't a ton else in terms of uh, great performances in terms of players. Um, we've already kind of discussed all the ones that mattered. Reichel, Gutman. I thought that Lardis looked good, as we mentioned. Colton Dock is still in training camp. He is still on the NHL camp roster. Now, I don't think that's going to stay that way, but he's got to the very end of the camp roster, and that's very impressive for him. Doc's going to be the first player caught up from Rockford this year as a, as a forward if he gets sent down to Rockford. Doc has been that good this preseason. It's been very impressive from him. And we saw it in the showcase. We've all kind of been, over the course of this uh, this podcast, we've been uh, fairly down on the Colton Doc uh, discourse. Of co- over the course of the Colton Doc discourse, we have been of the more negative opinions. That might be changing. And what's crazy is it looks like that might also be changing with Nolan Allen, another guy who the public discourse did not really like, but now you see him in preseason, you're like, he's actually pretty decent. Uh huh. I have to say this. I'm already, uh, there's a player I, if I can compare Colton Doc to, it's Ryan Hartman. Plays kind of, mm-hmm. he moves the puck well, kind of like Hartman does. He plays with his size to get to the boards. He reminds me of a bigger Ryan Hartman. Mm -hmm. I think he's a little more disciplined, which is a good thing. Yes, he is. (laughs) He's more disciplined. But do you know where I'm trying to come back? No, yeah, no. He has a good 
type of play that Ryan Hartman uses to kind of play on the edge slightly, but he knows how to move the puck well, get lay some hits. That's why I'm starting to see a little bit of a similarity of Colton Dock to Ryan Hartman. I don't know if that's the greatest uh, comparison, but it's still a comparison I'm starting to see out of Colton Dock. His intensity on the ice is higher than how I saw it with Col- Kirby over his tenure here. But um, Colton, honestly, I really like what I've seen from him. Yeah, I think there could be some... I want to see how he can perform in the AHL because yes, he did well in the WHL last year by WHL standards, mm-hmm. at least. If he comes out and he's out there with like 20 points in the first 25 games of the AHL season, like, okay, just get him on the roster immediately. Like, I don't care about anything else. Put him on the roster. Yeah. And the nice thing with him, I feel like he can play anywhere in the lineup. Like, you can put him on the wing – Put him at center and up and down the lineup. You could put him wherever. I feel like that probably He's a helps his good utility well. player. Yeah, that seems to be where the eventual plan for him is. Want to pivot a little bit into from the preseason recaps into the regular season start of the year previews. The Blackhawks play six games over the next two weeks. If you didn't notice already, we are going to be transitioning into a twice or into a once-every-two-weeks podcast. A little bit more consistent, a little bit easier to keep track manage. of, as opposed to going once a week, and a little bit more uh, better to manage as well. So we're going to try and go once every two weeks here. So we'll be back sometime. Probably have it out. We'll have this one out on either like Monday or Tuesday. Probably we'll have this one out on Tuesday the 10th. Next one should be out on Tuesday the 24th after that. But for here... We've got an episode that should be out on, if you're hearing this for the first time on Tuesday, then we have a Blackhawks game on that same day, 7 p.m. in Pittsburgh, opening night of the NHL season. And the next day we fly straight to Boston and we do it all over again. Hockey is back, baby. Back-to-backs are back, baby. Yep. (laughs) What a way to start the season. Of course, I think that it's great to see that we go, okay, Connor Bernard's first NHL game, Sidney Crosby. <laughs> There's no way that wasn't on purpose. Oh, no, definitely not. Oh, certainly. Oh. <laughs> There's no chance that, that had a, there was any reason behind that at all. Only, uh, It's only Bernard's favorite player growing up, so it's only... Not so fitting that it happens to be it's Pittsburgh. And also the Blackhawks eliminated Pittsburgh from the playoffs last year. So <laughs> a funny Robinson. And that's the reason run. we have Connor Bernard. Yes. Uh thank you, Buddy Robinson. Uh your, oh, Buddy your, Robinson. I miss your him. short tenure is very thankful for what you were able to accomplish. <laughs> Definitely. I think that one thing that we kind of glossed over, of course, the entire preseason, the Blackhawks, when you had their NHL roster out there against other NHL rosters, they held their own, which we didn't see last year in the NHL at all. They looked disastrous. I think that even though we're probably still going to be a quote-unquote bad team this year, I don't think we're going to be anywhere near as hopeless as we were last year. I mean, last year we finished the season off with 59 points on the year. I'm projecting 69 to 72 points on the season. That feels like a good point in terms of feeling like a fair assessment of where the franchise is going from where we were last year to where we are right now. Mm-hmm. No more 10 plus game losing streaks, I think. Hopefully. Knock on wood. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, moving <clears throat> over to the rest of the preseason, or moving moving over to the rest of the opening to this regular season, we have those two games, Tuesday, Wednesday. Then we go Saturday against Montreal, 
Hockey then night Monday in Canada. Against, yeah, Saturday against Montreal. That is hockey night in Canada. And then Monday against Toronto. So we stay there. Then we get two days rest. Then we fly all the way to Colorado. Jesus. Before we come back and play our first home game of the season against Vegas. So what's everyone's thoughts about Pittsburgh, Boston, Montreal, and then Toronto, Colorado, Vegas. There's a couple teams in there which are pretty difficult opponents, especially those last three. Yeah. I think we could come out with uh, – I think we honestly could come out with three wins in this. Yeah, I think that that's – I would love I, that to be the case. There's a possibility they could come out with three wins, and I can see it happening on opening night. If it's Arvid against Boston, I would take – I would still think – I can see the Hawks beating Boston. Boston really got worse, in my opinion, than what they – or still projecting their season to be this year in the rest of the NHL, I really don't think Boston's that good of a team. And I think we could beat them, especially since we're coming off of a game, yeah, a night before, but Boston hasn't played a game for preseason since uh, Friday, if I'm not mistaken. So I think a little bit of rust from Boston could, and also the it's their um, centennial home opener, it might lead to them having that ceremony before the game, causing them to kind of be in that doom and gloom of the ceremony of it lasts too long and the Hawks are just ready to hop on the ice. So I'm thinking the Hawks maybe take three wins out of this uh, six-game stretch. Okay. Um, I think that ceremony fatigue is overrated. We saw it with Colorado last year on opening night. I know, but it's also Boston. And Boston, when they do their ceremonies in their past, they have not played well. When they've had jersey retirements, they've had their Stanley Cup banner raising ceremony in 2011. That team has history of not playing well on ceremony nights. All right. So you've got three wins. Yes. And I think they could squeak out a win against either. I think they could squeak out a win in the final three game and one of the final three of that six stretch. Okay. Any specific predictions there? Maybe Colorado. The Hawks come into Colorado beating them. If it's our return right. bloom in that. Okay. Uh, Wally? Uh, to be honest, I think one win is probably the most realistic. Uh, coming against coming against Montreal, I think they lose all the other ones. I will say I think Pittsburgh goes into overtime, but they lose. So, but I think I think they only get one win out of that out of that six game stretch there. Okay, one win, three points, probably. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right, John. I'm going to say two wins. Um, I think against Montreal and Pittsburgh. And then I think all the other games are lost in regulation. Yeah, because I don't see okay, us going to... Okay, four points. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go with... Um... I'm going to go with six points, but it's going to come from two wins. Okay. I think we have several games that end up going to overtime. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that Connor Bedard is the type of player who you want in overtime because he can really take advantage of the space that's afforded to players in OT or the space that you just are guaranteed in OT because there's less people on the ice, and his speed can take advantage of that. I would say that we get a win against Montreal. I think the one of the overtime losses comes against Vegas. Okay. I think the Colorado game is going to be bad, actually. That one's going to be kind of disastrous. Uh, I'll say overtime loss to Toronto. 
And then I think we do actually take down Pittsburgh on opening night. So I'll go win Pittsburgh, then loss, win, and then overtime loss, loss, overtime loss. Six points, two wins. That's what I'm thinking. That's acceptable. I think that it's a decent start to the year, but yeah, we'll see. I mean, if they beat any of us, so we've got six points here, six points from Nick, five points or four points from John, and then you had three points, Wally. Yeah. If the Hawks do more than any of us, if they get seven or more points, we might need to start changing kind of what we think about where this team might be towards the end of the year. I know that the talent isn't the best, but we saw last year the coaching was good. Mm -hmm. So with an improvement in talent and coaching that looks consistent. Well, this season's not a year of tanking. It's a year of development and seeing how the young players gel in the NHL. So how it's looking like, okay, let's see how this thing goes. No slacking yeah, for this, Macklin. This year's a free hit. Last year was a nightmare from the beginning. This year's a free hit. Yeah. Fuck, Last year was so hard for Bedard, and now we have Bedard, and here we go. Slack yeah, no, it'll, be, no, 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 it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, Macklin? Yeah, slacking for Macklin. Macklin, yeah, that's what I was saying. Slacking for Macklin. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know what? San Jose can slack for Macklin. I, I, I want to see us actually win some games for us. I want to play hockey and watch hockey to enjoy it. Not like last year and having to almost rant after winning a game against Pittsburgh at the end of the year. I want to just celebrate some wins and have fun with it. This we year. can still do that, though, and get Macklin. Yeah. Like, you know. Now, it could be worse. It could be worse. We could be in the position we were in two years ago where the only good thing about that season was losing the draft lottery. Yeah. Now, I mean, hey, draft lottery exists. The draft exists. But we have players on this team that are actually important now. Yep. So that's the priority. Thank you, Kyle from Chicago. Thank (laughs) you, Kyle from Chicago. And with that, let's move into our prospect recap. Prospect recaps are going to be a little bit different this year as we're going to really focus on the top guys plus players who had really good weeks. So last year we really went and we kind of brought up every single player. If we have a guy who's like a late round pick that no one really talks about much, if they had like a zero point week and they barely played not really need to worry about that. Michael Crudel. Oliver Moore. <laughs> Sam Renzel. Frank Nazer. Um, Adam Guyon. Those guys. We'll talk about them a lot. If we have guys who had really good weeks, we'll talk about them too. I want to start with one of those guys, and Wally, you're here to help out with the process reports, but you know one of those guys who had a really good week? Nick Lardis. Yeah, he, he he got off to a pretty hot start so far. Uh, he has four goals in four OHL games. And honestly, I kind of expected it with how he ended uh, last season with Brantford. Um, and he played well in the preseason and the prospect showcase with the Hawks. So I'm not really surprised. And it's it's really great to see that he's producing. Yeah, I think so as well. He looks like a guy who... Hasn't really lost any steps from where he was to finish last season. Because last year, he was kind of a wacky one where he had that trade in the OHL and then he exploded. And it came out of nowhere. And he went from like a late round pick to a guy who could sneak into the second. And he ended up going in the early third. Steal. Yeah. I think so. I think I think he's definitely a steal. Uh, Peterborough did not really help his offensive numbers or a lot of players' offensive numbers. They kind of struggled when they were playing there. Once he got to Hamilton, which is now Brantford, uh, he just took off. I think he scored 30 goals, I believe, for them. And, like, I, I don't remember how many games, but it was pretty impressive. He was over a point per game, from what I recall, uh, once he got traded. So, 
Yeah. Uh, I believe it was he went from being half point a game to being one and a half points a game. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was pretty insane. Pretty insane. Um, the next guy that I kind of wanted to talk about is Roman Kansarov. Uh, I believe he was our 44th overall pick in uh, uh, this past draft. Um, in his last seven games, he has four points, one goal, and three assists. Uh, he's a plus minus of plus four and is averaging roughly 12 and a half minutes per game, um, which is, is pretty good for, for a 19 year old playing in the KHL. Like, actually, really impressive. Uh, yeah, we talked about this a little bit on the last episode. Ice time is a key thing when it comes to Europeans and professional leagues. And with the points and him actually, you know, getting to play games, it seems like even from a high stock position, Kantsarov just keeps on going up. Yeah. That was a nice goal. The real question is, I think the real, the real question you have to ask now is, when does the KHL contract expire? Uh, this next year, actually. Well, after this season, it's done. Sweet. And he has only has one more year. Yeah. Mm. So we could see Cancer Rob in Rockford next year. Yeah. Right. Theoretically, right. yes. We could. Um, I wanna because they don't have keep a keep talking. I wanna I wanna I'm look something up about Cancer Rob. Yeah. You move on to the next guy. Yeah, uh the next guy I wanted to talk about was uh Frank Nazar. Um in two games so far this uh college season, he has two goals. Uh, and he's playing primarily as the one C which is great to see after he missed pretty much the whole season last year and didn't really look like himself. Uh, so it's, it's really nice to see that like he's going right into the top center role, uh, playing big minutes for Michigan, which is one of the best teams in the country. So, Yeah. Um, so I did want to check on this. Uh, Roman Kantsarov has no draft rights in the CHL import draft. Um, and on top of that, he also... Uh, will be twenty. He he will be eligible for the AHL next season as well. Okay. So if we sign him up, he can go straight into uh, the AHL and straight to Rockford. He sweet. Mm. That's good to get him. Yeah, but early. with Frank, but don't see that a lot. That'd be great. Um, and then also with uh Frank uh Frank Nazer and how he performed. Um, I actually got a lot of uh a lot of a glimpse of that first game that he played. Didn't think it was great. However, the game that he played, the second game, a lot better. And then uh, the final guy is Adam Guyon. Uh, he had a rough few games. Uh, his, la- his last two games, he has an 818 save percentage, and he was pulled in one of them. Uh, not, what, not what you want to see. From your goalie, but the good news is his first three games were pretty much lights out. I believe he was hovering around a nine twenty nine thirty save percentage before those past two games. So hopefully he can nine twenty nine nine twenty nine. Hopefully he can bounce back after a few rough games. Yeah, um, and is that everything in terms of like big names, big performances on our prospect reports? Yeah, that's mostly. I guess the one one more thing. Uh, two of our prospects, two of our European prospects, made their like top league debut. Uh, Yuri Felchman, uh, he played his first two games, I believe, in the national, the Swiss National League, and then uh, Riku Tohila played his first two games in Liga uh, last week. So, mm-hmm. yeah, good to see them getting pro games. And I'll mention one more thing. Uh, first two games of the season, Land Slagger has two goals. So, boom, boom. Let's see how he does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And with that, we're going to do a quick recap of sort of the Rockford situation. Oh, so, John, we had a we had a couple of uh, Rockford preseason games. Uh, let's hear it. I mean, what is there to say? We got two touchdowns scored on us in two games. Not good. Um, so the first game I attended, it was a six to two wild. Actually, both the games were against Wild. Uh, and then the second game was 7-3 Wild. Um, so there were a bunch of players playing that I had no idea who they were in the first game. The second game, I have no idea who played because I would assume the same amount, the same uh, people played in the, or the same, let me restart that. 
In the second game, I have no idea who played because a bunch of our uh, Rockford regulars were in Chicago, like uh, Brett Saney, David Gus, those those guys. Uh, uh, I believe Stauber started the second game. Don't quote me on that because they didn't post any of their lineups on Twitter or Instagram. And then a guy named, what was his first name, Wally? Zach? Yeah, Zach Driscoll, I think. Zach Driscoll played in the first game, and what do we know? I do who that is. Um, I mean, That's Nolan Allen right. played fine. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Del Mastro played okay, I guess. I thought, uh, what's his name? Uh, Sorella, Sorelli. I thought he played Sor- pretty. Sorella, yeah. Sor- yeah. I thought he played pretty uh, consistent. Uh, I don't think uh, Roos had the best game though in the, in the first game. So yeah, that's that's what happened with Rockford. Hopefully, we don't look like that in the regular season. That's pretty rough. Yeah, I mean it's still the start of preseason for Rockford. They're still trying to figure out. Well, that's our only two preseason up. games. Yeah. But they're still a team that's or a it's a whole new roster compared to last year. So and also some of them were still up in Chicago last night. Like David yeah. Gus wasn't down. He was still up with Chicago. Uh Bjork. there's yeah, Bjork. There's still I, I players say, coming back. So the team I'll say this. The first the first game should not have been six to two. The second game is understandable, as you said, but uh, yeah, that's that first game was a bunch of our regulars, and uh, we did not look good. Mm-hmm. Certainly hope that turns it around. It's gotten, I would say, it's not necessarily easy when you lose your best defenseman and your best forward from the previous season. Yeah, hundred percent. Because they both got called up, and now you've right. got to reset from there. Yeah, I still think that, and obviously, I think I said this last year that the Ice Hogs were one year away from being much better. I still think we're one year away now, <laughs> even a year later. It's like it keep pushing down the, keep pushing it down. Of when are the Ice Hogs going to be good? Well, is it going to be this year? It's probably going to be next year. Now it's next year. It's still probably going to be next year. <laughs> This this Wait year till will next be, year. <laughs> this this year will be weird. We have Wait till next year. I think if I my if my mental math is correct, we have nine rookies playing across on on, on every positional level. So uh it'll be interesting to see how we play this year. Yeah. Uh so we start off on oh, hand. Um uh, so we also have, along with that, a uh, Rockford Ice Hogs schedule. Over the next two weeks, they will play three games, which is significantly less than six. But those three games are two in San Jose against the Barracuda. That's Friday and Saturday, of the 13th and 14th. And then the week after, they play against the unaffiliated Chicago Wolves, which I will always refer to them as the unaffiliated Chicago Wolves in this podcast. What a joke. <laughs> I thought I saw someone that they were. Carolina is sending. Carolina is now sending like the majority of their guys to the ECHL, apparently. Yeah, that's what I saw, which is like good players. They have good players, good prospects of theirs who are now going to the ECHL instead. Ridiculous. What's happening? Someone's got to take control of the Wolves, man. They're like a a little child. 33rd AHL team. It's. Um, I heard, oh, I don't know where I saw it. It was last season when the rumors started coming up about the Wolves being unaffiliated. That the AHL won't have more teams than the NHL. They're probably going to have to. I mean, I just they gave a whole know. reason as to why, and I don't know who di- who posted it and like and what that reason was. But I remember seeing it on Twitter. They need to if uh, Chicago continues to yeah. do what they are doing. I mean, yeah, they're, they're you know, Rocco Grimaldi signed there. Yeah. yeah, he did. Did Grimaldi go to Chicago? He went to the Wolves. They're going to be. I did a good not know team that. This year. You know, Rock Grimaldi signed with the Chicago Wolves. They're going to be a very good team this year. 
Okay. They're just like kicking and screaming. Just everything just, else like around a toddler. Well, because they prioritize results. I know. I I get it. Or, they're going to be the, they're going they're going to be the, they're going to be the only AHL team this year that's prioritizing results. Yeah. Over development. Yeah. So yeah like, and didn't yeah, last they, year? Like, didn't last year they uh, like, Didn't last year they held like a player that the Hurricanes called up. Shkatkov Ch- was it maybe? They didn't yeah. start him in the playoffs. Oh, Kuchetkov? I think they started Sachenko even though Kuchetkov was better in the playoffs. And the Hurricanes were not happy about it, obviously, because he was playing better than Sachenko. So I, I really don't understand. It's just a whole mess. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Um, but this is a Chicago Blackhawks podcast, not a Chicago hockey podcast. <laughs> yeah, no one cares about Chicago Wolves here. <laughs> and now no one really cares about Chicago Wolves because they have no they have no affiliates. So yeah. if you care about the NHL, then you don't really have a care for the Chicago Wolves at all. Yeah. Uh, so when we play the Chicago Wolves on Saturday the 21st, uh, we'll be paying attention to that. We'll be seeing what happens, and hopefully we beat those uh, the, the rogue ones. <laughs> <laughs> the rogues. We, beat, we, will, we will destroy the rebels. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. <laughs> it's has gone off the rails. So. <laughs> uh, this is the lone wolf. Is that? Is... We'll, we'll defeat the lone wolves. Oh my the god. Lone wolves. You know what? Hang on. Nick, you win. Lone wolves. It only fits. All right. And I believe that's everything. So with that, that is going to be the end of this episode of the Hockey Pupcast. Oh my god. We will be back in two weeks' time, and we will be back to talk about how the Blackhawks did over the course of those two weeks in the six games that we mentioned beforehand. Hopefully everything goes well, and Bedard time is fantastic. And Oliver Moore is the greatest player of all time. So thank you so much for joining me as always, Wally. Hopefully the Hawks do better than my in my predictions. I would hope so as well. Nick? Hockey is back. Yes, it is. And John? Prediction. Uh, Bedard scores a hat trick in his first game. Take it to the book. To take it to the bank. Okay. We will... See how that goes. You should put My name is Tyler. On it, this is the Hockey Podcast. I will see y'all next time. Take care. I'm not putting money on it, Nick. <laughs>